The Next.js app router has become stable and the recommended way to write modern full stack code. And to celebrate that, I created this full walkthrough of the app router with everything that you need to know what's new so you can build proper modern web applications. Follow along with the video and you'll notice a huge upgrade in the code you write in your following projects. We're gonna cover topics like routing. Very important to understand. How do you create static and dynamic routes? Then rendering. In the rendering chapter, we're gonna answer the question of which rendering strategy, there's a lot of options, should you choose for each page for the best possible page speed and therefore the best possible user experience. Then you can build the best possible app with amazing routing, amazing rendering, super blazingly fast pages. If nobody sees your app, it's kind of pointless. So we'll also get into SEO best practices. How can you get your website out there? There are a couple of super cool features Next.js has added to the app router that really allow you to push your website out there to new users through search engines. And then the last of the big four topics we're gonna cover in the video is API routes. Next.js is a full stack framework and writing your own super fast API routes is a massive cornerstone of Next.js. You're gonna learn how to do that properly in this video as well. So I highly encourage you to follow along, take your time, really understand the concepts. We're gonna go through step by step all the way together. After understanding these four topics, you're gonna know how to write a modern web application that you can push to users and they will have a very delightful and super quick user experience because you've mastered rendering, routing, and so on. Let's get into it and start with the first chapter and that is routing. Routing is important because it defines the fundamental architecture of our applications. Which pages can users navigate to? What do these pages contain? That is what we're gonna cover in this first chapter. Okay, here we are on the desktop and I've got my notes open here on the right so I don't miss anything. And to get started with the new Next.js app router, the most straightforward thing you can do is just create create a new Next.js app by saying npx create-next-app at latest. And with the latest version, which is currently 13.4, there are so many cool things that the pages directory just doesn't have. Okay, so let's name this app-router. You'll be prompted to enter a name. Hell yeah, we want TypeScript. Hell yeah, we want ESLint. And even more, hell yeah, we want Tailwind CSS. Now, the source directory is not mandatory. I think it makes the code a bit easier to overview. So I'm gonna say yes. And then the most important question, use app router. Of course, in this video, we're gonna say, yes, we want the new app router, which is even recommended now. Very, very cool stuff. We're gonna hit yes. And then would you like to customize the default import alias? No, we don't want that. So essentially we can leave everything as the default as is because that configuration goes really well. Okay, success. It's done installing our Next.js app. So what we can do is say CD, oh, and I just noticed I installed it in the wrong directory, but I moved it to the desktop. So we're gonna say CD desktop and then cd into app-router into the file we have just created and then say code dot, which is gonna open up the current directory we are in inside of Visual Studio Code. Let me zoom in so you can see this easier. And the first thing we'll do is take a look at the new routing. Take a look at this. It's the source directory, which we have opted into. And then it says app. Before it said pages, now that's the app directory instead. And the routing is actually quite different. So whereas in the pages directory, which by the way, we can still use normally for incremental adoption, we could just define a new page in here saying dashboard.ts or tsx in our case, because we're using TypeScript with JSX, create a new functional component in here. And if we started up this app with yarn dev or npm run dev, it won't matter. And then navigate to the dashboard page inside of our local host, you can use the pages directory just fine. That's a very important thing I wanted to point out. We're not gonna do this, but it is very, very helpful for incremental adoption. Okay, and as you just saw, I created a pages directory with a file called dashboard.tsx inside of it, which then mapped to a dashboard route which I just deleted so it can't be found anymore. In the app directory, the routing is fundamentally different. If we wanted to achieve the same thing, let's create a dashboard folder instead. Before it was a file, now it's a folder. And inside of this dashboard folder, we are gonna create a file called page.tsx. And this naming page.tsx is very important. It is enforced by Next.js. It won't actually end up in the URL, but the folder will. So we just created a dashboard route in the new app directory by creating a folder called dashboard instead of a file called dashboard. And then inside of that folder, a file called 
page.tsx. Very, very important. It's enforced by Next.js. And now we created a page in the new app directory. Take a look at this comparison, for example. In the Next.js 12, we had a pages directory. And for the main page, it was the index.tsx. In the app directory, it is now, again, very important, the page.tsx. And if we wanted to create a route like we just did, we would create a new folder instead of a new file name that folder whatever we want the actual route in the url to be for example dashboard without the slash and then inside of there goes a file called page.tsx whereas in next.js 12 or the prior versions to next.js 13 all of them we would just create a dashboard.tsx file instead so that's a very important distinction to make that's how you create routes and by the way you can opt out of routes if you want to use them for organization so for example let's say you had an auth route in which you want a login and a sign up let's get rid of all the unnecessary information we don't need for now let's just pretend you only had an auth route inside of your Next.js 13 application that you wanted to serve um, the login and the sign up for. So the way you do that is create a folder called login and inside of here goes a file and that is gonna be the, and you probably guessed it by now, the page.tsx, very important. That is gonna be inside of this folder and then similarly for the sign up, you would do the exact same thing also in the main app folder the folder is going to be called your route, what's going to end up in the URL. And then inside of here goes the page.tsx. And that's how you create a login and sign up route. What you can do, as I just mentioned, is you can opt out of a routing structure for your personal organization, which is a very, very handy feature. So instead of cluttering up your main app directory with all the top level URLs that you want to actually have in your application, what you can do is wrap this whole thing in another folder that you wrap in parentheses. So for example, you can say in parentheses auth, and then inside of that folder, put all the login and sign up and general auth information as, as much as that might be. And what you did with this in parentheses auth, this is just for your personal organization. This will not end up in the actual URL. Let's go ahead and try this out. Instead of the dashboard, let me name this to in parentheses auth. And then inside of here, we can create a folder called login, for example, which has a page.tsx. Just so we can see this easier, let's write login into this page. And now we have replicated the routing structure here on the left-hand side um, that I just showed you in Excalidraw, where we have in parentheses auth, then the login page that is actually gonna end up as a URL, and then the page.tsx. Now, if we navigate to just the login, this will work just fine because you have opted out of the routing structure using the parentheses. And this routing paradigm change that we have in comparison to the Next.js 12 or prior versions like this with the pages directory allows us fundamentally different things that we can do. For example, there are a bunch of reserved names. And to understand these, let's first take a quick aside and understand what server components are, because those are one of the most fundamental and important to understand changes in Next.js 13. I'm not saying they're hard to understand. That's a very important distinction, but it's very important to understand. We can get rid of the TypeScript stuff for now. We won't need that. And the fundamental change they introduced is, take a look at this. If I wanted to log out something in this component in regular React, Take a look at what happens. I'm gonna log out hello. So whenever we navigate to this page.tsx, it gets rendered, this code gets executed, and hello will be logged to the console. So let's go into our app, let's reload the page and take a look at the console log we have just done. And there is none, there is no console log hello. So the question is, where is the console log? Because the component rendered just fine, that means the code got executed. And what's very important to understand is in Next.js 13, this is a what's called server component. If you do not opt in to client-side rendering specifically saying use client, then this component is going to be run on the server and then shipped back to the client to actually be rendered. So if we take a look at where the console log happens, it happens on the server side and not on the client side unless we specifically opt in to use this component that we're rendering here on the client. If we did that, and then I refresh the page, now we can see the component got rendered 
on the client. And if you're wondering how that is done technically, take a look at this. Um, so on the server, we are preparing the what's called the VDOM. If you're familiar with React, you might know what this is. Essentially, it is a representation of the entire application in JavaScript using regular objects that are called React elements. This VDOM is prepared on the server and then passed to the client to be rendered on the client. However, if we are using server components, we cannot make use of client-side APIs like event listeners, for example. So the question arises, when do we use client and when do we use server components? And here is a very nice infographic to get a good understanding of that. For example, if you wanted to fetch data, you would do that inside of a server component because you can also directly access backend resources. If you're working with sensitive information, you want to do that on server components or in API routes, pretty much anywhere that's not the client to avoid leaking your personal secrets to anyone. If you're using large NPM packages like Markdown, for example, is usually pretty large, try keeping them on the server because whatever you use on the server in JavaScript is not going to end up as the client JS bundle. Whereas if you wanted to do things like interactivity, on-click, event handlers that depend on client-side APIs, you can only do that in client components. Anything that has to do with React hooks like use state, use effect, and so on, or class-based components, if you're coming straight out of 2015, you can only do that in client components as well. So sometimes you can use server components, sometimes if you want interactivity especially, you cannot use server components. If you can, I would advise you to use server components because they're faster and also ship less JavaScript to the client. If you wanted to do something like context, how would you do that? And an approach that has worked very well for me in the past for React context is declaring one component, a provider's component, as a client component. You need to do that because context is a React hook that you depend on. Turn that provider's component into a client component and then you wrap your server components with that client component. And that has worked super well for me in the past. If you want a code example, I'm gonna link one in the description. Congratulations. Your understanding of server components is one of the most important things to take away for the Next.js app directory. Let's now take a look at how you can really benefit from server components. As you know, you know their client side footprint is basically none because you're not shipping any dependencies to the client. However, a big question is how do we handle um, the user experience on server components. We can mark them as asynchronous. That's what we can do with server components. And then we can make database queries. For example, take a look at the JSON placeholder. That's an example API I'm just gonna use to make a you know, database call. This is the data we're going to get back. It consists of a user ID, an ID, a title, and a body. And that's what we want to fetch in our server component. We can do that at the top level using asynchronous. In Next.js 12, this was unheard of. This was not possible. In Next.js 13, it is in server components. So for example, we can say const data, and I'm gonna be using Axios for this, is gonna be equal to Axios, and we also need to install that. And then we can make a get request to the endpoint I have just mentioned, which is available under, you don't need to remember this, this is just in database call I'm mocking, jsonplaceholder.typical.com slash posts slash one. The cool thing is we can now use await at the top level. No use effect, no state, nothing needed, which is just amazing. Great, so now we have access to the data and let's render the data out as a json.stringify data. That's one of the most important changes of server components, fetching data at the top level. And let's see what happens. We've started the dev server back up. Let's reload the page. It's gonna make the request and then log out or display our data on this page right here. Great. However, there's one big question that arises. Um, how do we handle loading states, right? So we can't really keep it in state and then make a state check of whether we are currently loading this API request, right? Because, because it's a server component. We cannot use any React hooks in here. Very important distinction to make. Those also can only be used in client components because they rely on client-side APIs. So how do we handle loading state? For example, let's say this database call took really long. Let's say const wait is gonna be equal to any amount in milliseconds that we pass into this function. Then it's gonna resolve after that amount of milliseconds. And I think I'm gonna just use an await, a wait of five seconds. So if we save this page, then go back and reload this, um, the page will be loading for five seconds. 
it takes really long and the user is going to be very confused. There's no loading state, no nothing because we're fetching the data on a server component. And Next.js has of course thought of that. The way we alleviate this problem is through something called loading.tsx. So what we can do inside of our login file at this, in this case is going to be creating a loading.tsx file. Again, it's important that this is named loading.tsx. This is specifically for this purpose. And in this file, usually you would render out something like a skeleton or a loading spinner. I'm going to render out a loading div that just says loading. If we save this and take a look at the current routing structure, it's the auth, which does not get represented in the URL, the login folder, the actual page we navigate to, the component that is rendered when we navigate to the login folder in the URL, and the loading state for server components. This is not for client components, the loading state for server components for this specific route. And if we try reloading the page now, you can see what is in the loading.tsx is now being rendered while the five seconds are, you know, being awaited in the server component. And then whenever the data is there in the main page.tsx, then the server component removes the loading.tsx and is actually shown on the screen to the user. And that's how you can make a very delightful user experience, even with server components. However, there's one problem. What happens if something goes wrong during this data fetching stage? So let's say we're going to throw a new error and this is going to say um, not auth. Let's say the user is not authenticated, so they shouldn't be able to see this component. Currently, that is an unhandled error we're throwing and you're going to see what happens. Let's reload the page. It's going to wait for five seconds because it's still going to do the data fetching. And then we can see there's an error completely breaking or application. And that's pretty bad and makes for a horrible user experience. However, there's a very graceful way we can handle errors in Next.js 13. Okay, let's learn how we can handle errors in Next.js 13 like a pro. And Next.js makes it super easy, actually. It's very enjoyable. If you know React, you know there is something called a, um, an error boundary, right? If something fails to render during suspense, which may or may not happen, then the error boundary is called to display a user-friendly the message as what just happened, right? And let's say this page is an auth only page. Nobody that is not logged in is able to access this page. But let's say the const session is equal to null. So we are mocking the case that the user is not authenticated. In that case, an error should be thrown. So if not session, then we are going to throw a new error. And we can say, for example, auth is required to access this resource, which is a very user-friendly message, right? It's very clear. And now when we go to this page, what should happen is that this error gets thrown because there is no session that we're mocking. So if we go into the browser and navigate to this page, we can see auth is required to access this resource. Great. Well, what's not great is that our application currently crashes, right? Because this is an unhandled runtime error. That's pretty bad. But the good thing is that we know the error works correctly. And now we can actually handle that error like a pro. And the way we can do that in Next.js 13 in the experimental app directory is by creating a new file called error.tsx or .jsx, um, whatever you prefer. This is not TypeScript specific at all. And this is going to create an automatic React error boundary, meaning if something fails to load in suspense, right, there's an error boundary to catch that. And that's what this page right here is. I'm going to create this as a functional component. But as I said, no TypeScript needed. You could leave all this away if you wanted to and just save that. And by default, um, these error components, because we're passing them a function, Implicitly, Next.js does it for us. They need to be turned into a client component, as though otherwise this would not work. And now let's see what happens. So we are navigated to the error page and we can see the error right here, which is fine. But this means the error is now handled, right? We are navigating the user to another page that is about to handle the error. And that is way more user friendly. And this page gets two properties from Next.js, one being the actual error and the second property being the reset. 
it's a function. That's what I was talking about earlier. That's why this is a client component. A function we can call to redo the last action and see if that fixes the error. Super cool that we get access to that. Now, if you're in TypeScript, you might get an error because the types of these two are not defined. Error in that case would be of class or of type error, which is a class. And then the reset would be a function that returns void, but just if you're in TypeScript. If you're in JavaScript, don't worry about that. And now, for example, we could render out a button saying, try again. And on click of this button, we want the reset function to be called. Let's save that, go back into our browser, we get the button right here. And if we try again, you can see the error pop up again, which is great, right? I mean, in this case, it doesn't make any sense because we know the error is about to happen, but if something just went wrong because an API that you rely on in your app had a short outage, this try again would work properly, right? Just as you expected, which is a super good measure to make error handling user-friendly. And then to make this even more user-friendly, I've prepared just a little example right here that we can copy and paste. This is not about the styling at all, so I'm just going to paste this in. It has a bunch of Tailwind classes prepared for us, but I just want to, um, you to understand the gist of it, right? I'm going to save that. And uh, as I said, this is just for the styling. It doesn't make sense to get into that. Um, essentially, if I save that, as you can see right here, in the h1, we are displaying the error.message. And if we take a look at what we get access to on this error, we get a stack, a name, a message, and a cause. And I'm about to show you a way that is super convenient to make this even better. Okay, this looks pretty bad because my browser is by default in dark mode and this is in light mode. So let's give this a background of gray 900, for example. And I think that should now work. Yeah, okay, that looks better. Um, so we are displaying that the auth is required to access this resource, right? So the message that you can see right here is what we called in this error. And one way we can abstract that I think is super convenient. Um, we don't have to type this every time. Instead, we can create one exception that we can always throw when there is an error problem, an auth problem, for example. Meaning we could, instead of this, do something like throw new auth required error and that's it. Now this doesn't exist yet, but we can create that. So every time auth is required, you could just throw that error and be totally good to go. Now let's create that. Um, I'm going to do that in a file called lib and then under lib, let's create a folder called exceptions. And in this, or actually we can just create that as a file. We don't need that as a separate folder. Let's make a file called exceptions.ts. And inside of this exceptions, we can create our custom auth required error. The way we do that is by exporting a class with the name of that we just specified, the auth required error. And we don't even need to type this out ourselves. We can just say extends error, meaning we are copying all the properties from the regular error and putting them into our auth required error. Then let's put a constructor in here and that constructor takes the error message and we are going to default that to something like auth is required required to access this page period right and then a super in here that we pass the message and also this dot name this refers to wherever this is rendered like this particular instance of the class that we are invoking for example in this um in this example, it would be, you know, this, it's kind of a weird keyword, kind of weird to explain. Uh, I hope you got the hang of it. And then we can call this, for example, requires auth, or let's, let's call this the same thing as we called it up here, auth required error. There we go. We can save that. And that is all we need to do, right? Now we have created a custom exception. We can throw every time we want to handle this error and we can import it. Now let's just invoke that. And as you can see, the message is optional because we defaulted it to something. We could still change it if we wanted to, but we don't have to. We can just throw this error like that, go back to our page. And if we try to render this page again, we can see auth is required to access this page. Great, we have learned so much so far. How do we work with server components, loading states, error states, and so on? Very, very good job. There are a couple of open questions. For example, how do we work with 
dynamic routes. Until now, we've only looked at static routes, but if we wanted to have multiple posts on a website that we could access through the URL bar with different IDs, how would we do that? It's great you asked, let's investigate that. First off, dynamic routes. How the hell do you do it? Well, the approach itself is rather similar to the pages directory. So for example, let's create a folder called post. And inside of this folder, let's um, create a folder in angled bracket notation. I'm going to get to what this does in a second called post ID. And inside of this post ID, we can create a new file. Again, this will be called page.tsx. Very important. And this is going to be any component that you want to render out when the user navigates to slash post and then slash the post ID. Let's try this out. We can go to slash post and then slash one, for example. That's going to be the post ID and our page shows up. So fundamentally, what we did is create a post folder inside of there, a post ID folder, and then the page.tsx. The post obviously stays the same because it's a static route. It's not an angled bracket, so it will be represented as is in the URL. This is um, pretty small, but what it says is just slash post slash. Then when whatever we put into after the slash that comes after post, um, so this slash right here, whatever comes after that is going to be inferred as the post ID. So if I navigate to slash post slash one, this could be anything. This could be, this could be me random, Jesus. This could be me randomly typing in any letters. That would still just be the same post ID that is then passed. That's very important. This post ID is passed to our page.tsx. So we can receive it at the page.tsx level and then do data fetching logic, for example, with it. And the way we do that in Next.js is pretty interesting. So by default, our page receives props. Now let's just log out the props. Let's say console log props. Whenever we go to this page, we are going to log out these properties. We are inside of the dynamic route. So let's navigate to this, refresh the page and see what it logged out to the console. This is a server component. So remember, it's going to be logged in the actual VS Code terminal instead of in the browser console. We can see it says params instead of an object, post ID, and then whatever I typed in after the slash as the post ID, as I just showed you. And there's also search params. Very interesting. So we get access to the post ID. And the reason this is called post ID is because that's what we have in these angled brackets right here. If I were to change whatever is in the angled brackets, what is being passed to the page is going to be the same thing as in the angled brackets. If you're in TypeScript, you could do something like receive these params explicitly inside of the object and then type them out inside of the page props. So in our case, we know this is of type string the page props and then the params and we could display the params dot. Oh, and of course this needs to be an object containing the post ID and that is of type string, right? So we can remove the console log. And if we wanted to do some data fetching logic, we could get access to the post ID just like this. So now whatever I type in after the URL will now be displayed as the page content. And what you would normally do is some um, DB fetching with this information. For example, this is an article ID. You want to get the article content from your database. You can do that again, what we just did at the top level by marking this as asynchronous. For example, you could do that um, by removing the type saying this is an asynchronous function and then defining the type like this, that would work just the same. And now at the top level, because this is a server component, we are not using client anywhere here. Um, we could do database fetching at the top level and then display the actual article content. That is how dynamic content is achieved in Next.js 13. Now, Josh, what's the search params? What are those about? And what you can do is if you make a get request, you can pass params by entering a question mark. Unfortunately, I can't zoom into this, but what I'm typing right now is slash post and then for example, slash one, and then um, the question mark and then search query is gonna be um, hello. For example, these would be the search params that are passed into the page. So let's enter that as the URL and see what happens. I'm gonna type in search query is gonna be equal to hello, hit enter. And then again, let's log out whatever comes in as the props. I'm not gonna bother typing this out. So let's just say props so we can take a look at whatever is incoming. Let's mark these as any so we can just log them out. 
and return an empty div that does nothing. Let's just say hello on the div and see what happens. Let's reload the page and now take a look at the search params that come in. As you can see, it's an object with whatever we typed in as the get request params that are being passed to this page. Now, what if we wanted to enter multiple slashes in the URL bar? So for example, what I'm doing right now is this slash post slash one slash and then for example blue if this was some or let's say these were um, shopping items this would be the first item and then the color would be blue just as an example what's important here is that we're entering another slash after the id which we haven't mapped to in our routing structure we only are accepting a slash post slash one to asd whatever and then comes the page.tsx. So if we type in another slash and then blue after this, our application does not know how to handle that. But doing that, handling that properly is very straightforward. We can turn this dynamic post ID into something called a catch all segment. Now, by inserting a dot 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 before the post ID, we can see what happens. We're still logging out the props. Let's reload the page and now our application knows how to handle this route because the catch all segment, as the name might suggest, whatever we type after the post ID, this right here is our catch all segment, the one. And we could type slash blue slash, ye slash yellow slash doesn't matter because now it maps to everything that comes after it. If we take a look at the console, we can see post ID and now it turned into an array. And this array is separated by the slashes in the URL. So I typed in this as the post ID slash blue and that's how these two end up in this array. Congratulations, you're now an expert in Next.js routing. You know how to properly route. You know how to take advantage of server components, handle their loading state and error states for the best possible user experience. Very, very good job. In the next segment, we're gonna take a look at rendering and why rendering is so important is because it determines a lot about the speed of our application. The more static a page is in general, the faster it will be. So let's take a look at how to use rendering strategies in Next.js. There are a couple of options to your advantage for the best possible page speed. So not only in terms of routing, but also in terms of rendering, a lot has changed in Next.js 13. Let's say this was a server component before, right? By default, it was a client component, but again, I'm talking about Next.js 12 here. You could turn it into a server component by exporting an asynchronous function called get server side pro oops, props, for example, and whatever you return as an object as the props inside of this get server side props function would then be passed as props into the component on the server, then be put into the HTML to be retrieved on the client. And that's how it worked under the hood. This function along with um, the static params do not exist anymore. The way you do this is now fundamentally different and it's also fundamentally easier. Let us switch away from the post example for a second and let's create a very normal um, folder, for example, called dashboard. And this dashboard has a page.tsx. So this maps to a slash dashboard um, URL and then renders the page as the component for this path. The way we can check how this is rendered is by building out our application. Let's stop the development server for a second and then run yarn build or npm run build it does the exact same thing it's gonna make a production ready version of our application and for each path that's the important thing it's going to exactly tell us how that path is rendered which is super convenient so whenever this is done building we can now see how each path is exactly rendered for example, let's take a look at our main dashboard that we have just created. We see how much um, kilobytes of JavaScript it ships, its size, and we can see the rendering strategy, which is this little dot right here. Let's take a look at what this dot means, and we can check that down here. It means static, automatically rendered as static HTML uses no initial props. So what Next.js has done is it took a look at our code inside of this page, and determined there is nothing that needs to be dynamic about this page. There's no database call being done. All we can do is just take the HTML and render it out statically at build time, making a request to this page super fast because it's already statically generated. 
Whereas if we take a look at the dynamic post and then the catch all post ID that we created in the last chapter, this is dynamic. Now there is a strategy to turn this into a static route as well. I'm going to get to that in a second, but by default, these dynamic routes are obviously going to be dynamic because you're going to make database calls in them. And now there's two interesting things. First off, as I just mentioned, Next.js determines these renders rendering strategies automatically. However, what we can do is very interesting using the regular fetch API. Let's say const res for response is going to be equal to await, and then we're going to make a fetch request. And what you'll be able to see is that Next.js has modified the regular fetch we use. Let's get rid of Axios. We won't need it. So what we can do now is specify the caching behavior. If we enter in an object after the main URL that we want to make a get request to, we can see cache. And then if we pass this a string, we can see there are a couple of options we can choose from force cache, no cache, no store, only if cached or reload. And the most important ones are force cache, which is the default where the request is made once. And then when it's made subsequently from that cache, the data is going to be pulled. And then we also have no store, which avoids a cache altogether. If I save this page and then let's convert the const data is going to be equal to res.json. We need to await this operation and let's render out the json.stringify data on our page. Let's rebuild the application and see what happens. Because we have opted out of the caching behavior, this turned into a dynamic route because that's exactly what we want, right? For every request that is made, and by the way, this is the equivalent of get server side props in Next.js 12. This is the same thing, having a dynamic route oops, in here. So every time a user is requesting this page right here, Next.js knows that it should not cache the response. And because of that, it's going to make the request to this endpoint every time this resource, this page is requested by any user. Now, what we can also do as kind of the best of both worlds is an incremental static regeneration approach. This is nothing new by itself. You know it from Next.js 12. And what it means is we are actually caching the data, but revalidating it at certain time intervals. The way we do that is by doing something called next by passing that as an object into our fetch request. And we can pass that an object in turn. If I press control and spacebar to see what this next property inside of a regular fetch request takes, it's a revalidate. And what this revalidate takes, we can hover over it. It's a number or false or undefined. Let's enter a number of 10. And by the way, this is in seconds. So what this means is every 10 seconds, the request is invalidated, but up to those 10 seconds, it is still cached. If you take a look at our built out application, it turned our dashboard back into a statically rendered app. And whenever a user requests this resource, the result of this fetch request as the response is being cached for 10 seconds. And after these 10 seconds, that result is invalidated, meaning the next time that doesn't have to be right after 10 seconds, but any time above 10 seconds, this exact resource, this page is requested again, then the cache will be deleted and the request is actually going to be made again. So you can imagine it as a compromise of A, the st completely static rendering, and then B, the dynamic rendering as kind of the best of both worlds. However, I already hear you screaming, Josh, please do not make me use the native fetch API. And you know what? I 100% agree. There are many better solutions you could use like Axios, for example, the most straightforward one. But if we try this in Axios, Axio, let's await axios.get and we of course need to import Axios for this, make a request to any endpoint and try it passing at the same object. And then let's say cache. Oh, there is no caching option in Axios. Let's try with the next. Oh, that doesn't exist either like in the native fetch API. So does that mean we are required to use the native fetch API for any data fetching that we do where we want to specify something like the caching and the revalidation? The answer is no. You can customize that on any per page or per layout level. And what that means in practice is you can get your data however you want. For example, by saying axios.get and then let's enter back the 
trusted old route in here, destructure the data. That's how we want to gather data. As we know, because we built out the application a few minutes ago, this would be a static route. This being saved in static JSON that is then being put into the page, into the static page whenever the resource is requested. If we don't want that, but still want to use a data fetching HTTP client like Axios, what we can do is export a const. And if we wanted to force this page to be dynamic, for example, we could say export const dynamic is going to be equal to, and then pass a string and hover over the dynamic. You can see the dynamic option provides a few ways to opt in or out of dynamic behavior. So it's the alternative to specifying this in the fetch directly. We could say auto force dynamic error or force static. So let's say we never wanted this result to be cached. The way we do that is by saying force dynamic. And interestingly enough, if we now build out the application again, remember before it was a static route or dashboard. If I build out the application again, as you can see right here in our dashboard, we can see there's now a Lambda in front of our slash dashboard. And if we take a look at what the Lambda means down here, it means server. Server side renders at runtime instead of at build time, like the static one, uses get initial props or get server side props. That's the equivalent I mentioned earlier. Great, so we have turned our dashboard into a dynamic route where this fetch request is made every time this page is requested, but without using the native fetch API. But if we wanted to use the same with revalidation, right? That's the very cool thing about Next.js. We can incrementally invalidate the cache. That is super straightforward as well. We can, instead of the dynamic, export a const called revalidate. If we hover over this, we can see the revalidate option sets the default revalidation time for that layout or page. Again, you can define this on a layout or page basis. Note that it does not overwrite the value specified by each fetch. So if you specified something different than in here in your fetch requests, which is very possible if you think of a very highly nested file tree, then that fetch request would overwrite what you specify right here. But we can say zero, any time interval, any positive number or false if we wanted this page to be completely static. So let's export, for example, a 10 second interval from here that is valid. And if we rebuild our application one last time, let's see what happens to the rendering strategy of our dashboard page. You can see just like with the revalidation in the fetch, it turned again into a static page, just like we would expect. And the main benefit that static pages bring to us are better performance because they are not being requested at runtime. The data does not need to be fetched at runtime um, where you have to deal with API latencies. If they are static, you don't need to worry about that at all. So the question is the dynamic posts we have created, right? It would be better if we turn those into static assets instead of requesting them at runtime. How do we do that? Is that possible? In Next.js 12, it certainly was. And in Next.js 13, it definitely is as well. Let's take a look at how we can do that. So what we want to turn into a static path is essentially the post ID right here, right? So what we can do is navigate in here. And I'm just going to change this back to a regular dynamic segment, makes this a bit easier, and then go into our page.tsx. To statically generate this route at build time, let's export. And this is going to be an async function that is called, very important, this is enforced by Next.js, generate static params. And inside of this function, what we need to do is export or return an array that contains a value for each, um, you know, post ID, whatever we specified in these angle brackets right here. So if you were to say const post is going to be equal to an array. And for example, in this array, we're going to have post one and post two. Th those are the paths, the actual URL paths. So I'm going to separate them with a dash. Those are the URL paths of all the posts that we have in our application. Then what we need to return from this function is an array. So for example, let's say posts.map. And for each post, we are going to return an implicit object by wrapping this in parentheses. Again, this would be the same as saying we're going to invoke a code block and then explicitly return an object from there. It does not matter syntactically. And what we need to do now is return the post ID, whatever is in the angled brackets. Very important. And the post ID is going to be, in our case, just um, the post because this is literally the ID as a string. In your case, this would most likely be an object and you'd say 
post.id if you're fetching this from a database. Okay, let's save this. And now what's gonna happen in the build is very, very interesting. So I'm gonna say yarn build or npm run build. It does not matter. It's gonna create or optimize production build. And it is also for this dynamic route going to run this function to get all the paths and turn this into a statically generated route. You can see the icon here changed, but it is neither completely static nor is it completely dynamic. It's a filled out dot that we haven't seen before. Let's take a look at what this filled out dot means. And it means SSG, server side generated automatically generated as static HTML and JSON. Um, so whatever we get back from these posts as the data is gonna be put into JSON, into our component. And what that does for us, essentially turning this from a dynamic page into a server-side generated page is it makes the pages way faster because the API does not need to be called at runtime whenever the user is entering this URL, but instead it's already there as static JSON and being passed into our static page. Um, whenever the user requests this resource. So turning this into a SSG page using the generate static params, especially if you know there aren't gonna be like 2 million of these posts is actually a very good idea and is very easily done in Next.js 13. And that leads us to one last thing. As I mentioned earlier, you can opt in or out of the revalidation or dynamicness in something called a page or layout basis. What is the layout exactly? It's also a, rever a reserved file type and there is always a root layout generated for us. This is by default again on the server because we are not specifying use client here. And if we don't do that, this is gonna be a server component. And it also, that, that's funny, it's highlighted the metadata because um, the Next.js metadata API is not allowed in a client component which makes sense. So let's close all of the other files. Let's say close others and just focus on the layout right here. What is this? Let's take a look at our current app structure. So we have a slash app, the new app directory. Inside of here by default, oops, is always a page.tsx because you need an index page. And there's always going to be a layout.tsx. These are enforced by Next.js. Even if you try deleting the layout, you can't because it's gonna regenerate it when you build the application, which is very funny. So you have to have a layout.tsx. And if we take a look at what this layout takes, it's children that it then renders out in the body. And as the layout name might suggest, the whole application, at least in terms of the root layout, is going to be passed through this layout as the children. So say we had a dashboard in our application. You know by now that the way we do that is by creating a folder called dashboard that then in turn, oops, has a page.tsx inside of that folder. That's how we do a dashboard. Every component, every page, everything that is below a certain layout, there's not just one, you can create a layout everywhere in your application. You can't just, or you, you could have one, you can have multiple. Everything that is in the file structure below this layout in any subfolder is going to be passed through this layout in rendering. So that means if we had a dashboard page, it would be passed as children into the root layout because in the file tree, the dashboard is going to be lower than the current layout. Because of that, it's going to be passed into this layout as the children. We can do whatever we want with it and then render out the actual children. If we didn't render out the children in the root layout, of course, what would happen is our whole application wouldn't work anymore. And I think our development server is not running. Let's start it back up. For example, let's try navigating to the dashboard. And while the page will actually be found because it is present in our file tree as the dashboard slash page.tsx right here, it is not actually rendered out. Everything that's beneath this layout in the file tree is going to be passed in as children. And if we don't render it out, of course, there's going to be no content in our page. That's why it's very crucial to render out the children. And the main benefit the layout gives you is you can actually create layouts for your apps. And these layouts will actually share state between re-renders. So when the children re-renders, when something happens inside of our dashboard component, the layout doesn't really care. If I change the page, from slash dashboard to whatever else, this dashboard would not re-render, it would keep its state, which saves us a lot of computing power. What we could also do is define a layout anywhere where we have a page.tsx possible. For example, in this, let's define this as a layout component. 
we're going to get our React children that are of type React node, if you're in TypeScript, that automatically get passed in here. You don't need to worry about that. And if we didn't render them out right here, that means our main page.tsx would still work just fine because this layout right here is not above this page.tsx. Above meaning it's either on the same level or you know, in the file tree above it, any folder above it. So this layout is only going to apply to this page.tsx that is also in the layout. And we can validate that. Let's navigate to our main um, file or main URL, the homepage. That works just fine. If we tried navigating to the dashboard, then that dashboard is passed through the um, layout.tsx that is in the same folder. And because we're not rendering out the children, only this page.tsx on the dashboard is not actually being displayed to the user. Now there's another file that is called template instead of layout. I don't really want to get into it. It's a, a pretty similar thing and I have never needed it for any of my production builds, even when the air browser wasn't stable and it wasn't even recommended for production. There, I just wanted to let you know there is something called template. It does a very similar function. Um, to the layout, but what you really use is actually the layout. Great, we've now taken an in-depth look into rendering and also routing, both of which super important for Next.js 13. But you can build the best web application in the whole world using the most advanced routing and rendering strategies, incremental static regeneration, everything super cool. If nobody sees your app, nobody will care. So in the next segment, we're going to take a look at SEO. How can you make your site rank well in Google? What changed in Next.js 13 that helps you rank your site, improve the SEO, and actually get your website out there and seen by real users on a search engine? I think the coolest feature they've implemented for SEO purposes is you can now generate sitemaps for your entire application at build time. That is super powerful. And the way you can do that could not be easier. Let's go into the app directory and create a new file called sitemap.ts or .js if you're using JavaScript. And inside of this file, let's export default an async function. And we can close out of this, by the way. And this function needs to be called sitemap. And inside of this function, whatever we return as an array is going to end up in our sitemap. So for example, we wanted the posts as part of our website, right? Let's say there are a hundred posts that belong to our website and we want all of those indexed in our sitemap. What we can do is make a database call fetch all the posts. Again, this is going to be our trusted JSON placeholder um, posts and then const all posts are going to be await res.json and let's type this as a custom type that is post. We know from fetching the um, JSON posts earlier what this type is. Um, so I just typed it out here. And then let's map over these. Let's say const posts is going to be all posts.map. And for each post that we have in all of our posts, let's return an implicit object. That's how we do it, just like earlier. And then the URL url is going to be http double slash localhost 3000 slash you know let's say post and then slash and let's change this to a template string so we can dynamically insert the post dot id and this corresponds to our routing structure that we have with the posts where we have slash post slash the id this is the ID, this is our post route that you can see in the folder right here. And then we could also do something like uh, last modified, which will then also go into our sitemap to show the recency. And let's just say a new date and we need to separate this by a comma. Great. Now these would include all of our dynamic routes for our sitemap, which is great, but we don't only have dynamic routes, we also have static routes. And the way we can also index the static routes are, let's say const routes, we can close out of this, it's gonna be. And then let's put all the static routes in here. For example, the homepage, just an empty string. Then let's say we had a slash about page, just for example, and a slash blog, or in our case, that's gonna be the slash post, because this is currently not indexed either, just the dynamic routes are. So we can map over these. And then let's say for each um, static route we have, we're also going to return the same object where we have a last modified and we also have a URL. And by the way, let's convert these new dates into a to ISO string. Great. Now the URL is going to be fundamentally different. This is going to be HTTP 
local host. Let's scroll down a bit so this is easier to see, 3000. And because this is a template string, we can dynamically insert the route. So HTTP localhost 3000, nothing, slash about, slash post. And now the important part, let's return an array where we spread in all these posts and all these routes. So we can say dot 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 routes to spread this array into here and also dot 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 m posts. Great. And now if we build out our application by running npm run build or yarn build, it's going to generate the whole sitemap for everything that we specified in our static routes and in our dynamic posts, or um, I guess these are also routes. It's gonna compress all of those into our sitemap, which is gonna make it very easy for SEO crawler bots to index all of our sites on our page. And you're gonna see what that looks like when this has finished loading. It has run the sitemap function. And if we say yarn start to run the build out production version of localhost, let's navigate to localhost 3000 slash sitemap.xml. And let's let that load. And as you can see, it's put all the static routes at first, just the home page, the slash about page and the slash post. So all of those are indexed. And then it has went ahead and ran the query we have specified right up here. It has fetched the information and put all of the results also into our sitemap. That's what you can see here. It's the first post, the second post, the third post, and a characteristic of the API we're using for all of these posts is that it only goes up to 100. So it has generated all the important stuff in our sitemap, like the last mod or the LOC for us. Super convenient, very, very nice for our SEO. And what we can also do is specify open graph images for our app. We can do this dynamically. I'm gonna show you the static approach. It's gonna be sufficient for 99% of use cases and it is by far the simpler one. So if you wanted to make a custom image when the URL to your website is shared, you can do this on a per route basis. I'm just gonna do it in the main app directory for now. And the way you do that couldn't be more straightforward as well. You can drag an image. I'm just gonna drag my Discord profile picture inside of the app directory. And then it's important to name this file a certain way. In our case, this is gonna be open graph image. And this can be PNG, it can be JPEG. It's automatically going to be inferred by Next.js and put into the proper meta tag with the correct ending and the correct format. And just like that, we can specify an image that is shown whenever we share a link, in this case, to our homepage. By the way, this, as I said, does work dynamically. I'm gonna pull up the Next.js documentation for this because I don't wanna bore you with this. Um, but essentially, you would create an open graph image.tsx that allows you to run your custom code. And here, define the size, the alt tag, the content type, and the runtime that you want. And you actually generate a, you know, just HTML that is then gonna end up as the actual open graph image and specify it that way. This is what this ends up with, because after all, it's just HTML. It ends up, also the static ones, as meta properties with the open graph image, OG image, and then um, the content Next.js does for you. You don't need to worry about that. So dynamically, this is totally possible, but I don't think it's worth the hassle. And it also applies to like a very, very small percentage of use cases. And also important for SEO is, of course, the page title and the page description. And as we saw earlier in the main layout.tsx, Next.js already generates these for us. This is the actual page title when we navigate to the homepage. Then this currently is create next app. And we can verify that if we go to the dev version of our app, let's run yarn dev and navigate to the dev version. And as you can see in the, it might be a bit small for you, but the tab is named create next app. That's what the title here is for. If I change this to Josh's app, Josh's app, there we go. Save that and we went back to our development server. We can see Josh's app now shows up as the page title for every single route in our app because we specified this in the main layout. That's very important. However, we could um, define this in every page, in every layout. Um, so for example, if we wanted the dashboard to have a different name, approach A we could take is just copy pasting this into the layout we use for the dashboard. If there were multiple directories inside of the, inside of the dashboard, then this would apply to all of them because we're specifying it in the layout and as I mentioned earlier, all lower pages are being passed through this layout. So let's say we wanted to call this dashboard of Josh's app. This would only show up if we actually navigate 
to the dashboard and if there were any all subsequent routes of this. As we can see, dashboard of Josh's app. If we only wanted this to show up on a certain page, the approach we could take, instead of declaring it in the um, layout, we could, we could declare it in the page. We could just declare it here and say dashboard page. Now in this case, the effect is going to be the exact same. It says dashboard page, but if there were any subsequent routes in the dashboard, so for example, slash dashboard slash user slash John or whatever, then this metadata, because it's now defined on a per page basis, will not be applied to this. And if there's nothing more specific defined for that page, it will always fall back to the main layout right here, always to this metadata because it's the highest order one. What happens if you want to define this metadata dynamically? For example, in our dynamic post ID route, how would you do that? And the, as you know from earlier, we are receiving params inside of our page. That's going to be whatever is specified right here. So if we type this out in TypeScript, there would be an interface page, um, page props. This is what you know from earlier. We are receiving params, an object, that has whatever whatever's inside of these angled brackets. In our case, that's gonna be the post ID and of type string. We can get rid of the generate static params for now. And we can define this server component as receiving these props right here. And we can do the same thing with the metadata if we want to generate it dynamically. So what we can do is export an async function, oops, fun from the layout, from the page, does not matter. And this function also receives the params. Oh, and this of course needs to have a name and the name is generate metadata. Um, again, important that you name it this way. And this function is going to return a promise, if you're in TypeScript, of type metadata, a type that we get from next. Then inside of the body, we can A, make a request to whatever source of data we want, and then B, if we return something from this metadata, because we defined the type up here, we know all the possible things that we can return if VS Code loaded. There we go. And we can see all the possible metadata that we could return from this function, like the title or the description, a Twitter, uh, I think it's an image, a viewport, anything that we want, essentially. Let's return a title and let's again go back to the example. So for example, the const res is gonna be a wait fetch and let's fetch any post. So we want to put this in a template string and depending on the post or the um, ID that we get passed in the params, that's what we're going to fetch. So the URL structure for this is going to be slash posts and then slash and then it's, you know, one, two, three, whatever. So we can say params dot and also we can type the params as page props. So we know what type they are. And now we can say params.post ID. And we know the type of the response. This is going to be const data is equal to res.json. We need to await this operation and then we're casting it into a type as the post type. We already know this from earlier. And now we could return the data dot and we can see there's a body, an ID, a title, a user ID. I'm just gonna go with the data dot title. And what that is actually doing is it's returning the title, this right here of the post slash one slash two, whatever that we're fetching. So if I move this over, save this and navigate to our browser, let's go to slash post and was it posts or post? It was post. Okay, so single post, let's go to post one. And the metadata right here shows up. It's a bit hard to see because I can't zoom in, but it does show up in the actual site title. So it's S-U-N-T as the first letters of whatever, you know, cryptic uh, lorem ipsum is right here. That's the page title now. And that's how we generate dynamic metadata. If I navigate it to the second post, that would change to whatever the title of the second post would be. Very nice. We know how to route properly, we know how to render properly, and we also know how to get our page out there into the search engine so people can actually see it. Next.js is a full stack framework. That means we can write our own API endpoints. And the way we do that has fundamentally changed in comparison to Next.js 12. It really is a big difference. So let's get into it and take a look at how you can write proper Next.js 13 API endpoints. Okay, happy birthday. Your app now ranks well on Google because you've mastered all the Next.js 13 SEO 
um, things there are. Very, very good, but now you want to write your own API endpoints. How do you do that? That's a very big feature of Next.js after all, and we don't want to miss out on this. So I'm gonna close all the tabs to make it less cluttered. And then from the pages directory, you know you can create an API folder, which is there by default already. And then you can create a file and that file is gonna be your actual API endpoint. Just like with the routing logic, where there's a folder that's representing the URL, and then a file that is enforced by Next.js that is not going to end up in the URL, the same thing goes for the API. So right now there's no API folder in here. And what we can do is create a new folder called API. By the way, you don't have to put your APIs in the API folder. Any page you could turn into an API. Um, but it is a common convention to put these into the API directory. And then what we want to end up in the URL is going to go into the folder name, just like with the routing structure. So let's say we wanted to create an API for user. Um, that's what's going to end up in the URL. And then inside of this user folder, we're going to create a file. And now the name is not going to be page.tsx, but it's going to be route.ts. Very important you name it route because that's what Next.js is you know, listening to for your APIs. So this name is enforced by Next.js if you want to write API routes. And now what is fundamentally different in these new routes is instead of one route, one handler, so traditionally we did this, right? Export default const handler, and then this got a request and a response, and it returned something, and this syntax is not correct, and you know you can't do it like that, but export default handler. This is the way we handled um, Next.js 12 or anything prior to 13 endpoints. The fundamental difference now is we can export the HTTP verbs from the route.ts file. So we can say export, and it's important this is a named export, not a default one, async function get, for example, the HTTP verb get. And now if we made a request to slash API slash user, not the route.ts, just API user, and a get request, then this function will handle that get request. Similarly, if we made a post request, async function post, then this function would handle it. So for example, let's log out get request in the get, and let's log out a post request in the post. And we can try out if this works. If the development server is running, great. And we can see if this works. Let's curl the HTTP localhost 3000 slash API slash user, we know that's gonna call the get request right here. And we got nothing back because we didn't return anything from the function, but we can see a get request was made. And if we did the same thing using a dash x post, making a post request to the same endpoint, we get nothing back, but we can see the corresponding HTTP verb function post has been triggered. So that's how we handle the different HTTP methods inside of one single route.ts file. Now, an important concept to grasp for these routes is how you get and return data from these. So the only thing you get inside of the get or post or whatever, any HTTP method is going to be the rec, the request. And this is going to be a of type request, which is built in just a native type or Next.js also provides a next request type from next server that you can use for this request. And the way you return data from these endpoints is also fundamentally different. Instead of having something like a res dot, oops, like it was before, a, and it won't let me type that because it doesn't know what it is. Like a res dot state is 200 dot JSON, and it's inside of here you define the JSON payload that you want to return. That's not how we do it anymore. Instead, we return a new response class, which is just a native web API. And inside of here, we can either pass a string like OK, or if we wanted to pass a JSON payload, we could json.stringify anything like an object with the name of John, for example, that is then going to be returned to the client. If something went wrong and for example, the user is unauthorized to get this response, then we could pass an object, the um, properties as the second thing, um, as the second um, you know, argument into the response class. And you know we get a headers, a status or a status text for example, we could pass a status of 401 unauthorized um, if the user you know, is unauthorized. Let's save that and see what happens. Let's make another curl request to this endpoint and we can see there's a name John, just the response that we passed back here. Phenomenal, really, really good. 
Now the question is, how do we get access to something like um, the search params, for example, in a get route? If I made a request to this endpoint um, using the same URL, but for example, with a question mark and then my search param is equal to hello. Currently, we are not reacting to that in the API endpoint. If you wanted access to these in a get request, the way we could do that is by destructuring something called search params from a new URL class. And into this URL class, we're going to pass the rec.url. Now we have access to the search params. And now we can do something really cool. For example, if we wanted to retrieve the my search param, we could say const my search param is equal to, and now search params dot, and this has a method called get, which takes a string of whatever search param you want. For example, my search param. And let's log this out in the console log. Whenever we make a call request to that API endpoint with the my search param, this should get logged to the console and it does right here. So this is how we get the get request search params. And also arguably more important, the post request payload. This is also of type next request or the regular um, request that both works. And in Next.js, anything prior to uh, 13, we could say rec.body. This doesn't really work, but let's take a look at this. Let's make a post request to this endpoint like that post request and we log the response body. Um, you can see this is of type readable stream, locked false, state readable, supports biop false. That's not really what we are expecting as the post request body. Um, so instead what we can do is get the body another way. Let's say const body is going to be equal to and then rec.json. We are assuming that whatever comes in is in JSON format and we can await that operation. That's how we get access to the post request body content. And let's just return a new response saying, okay. And if I make a request to this endpoint, let's log out the body in here. I'm going to make a request using postman here on my site that contains a post request body. And exactly, I'm super original. I know the post request body I passed was named John. And that's how we get access to the post request body content. If you've ever worked with the experimental edge runtime in Next.js 12, you'll know that the syntax is the same as that. The regular API route syntax was different, but if you're using the edge runtime, you would also um, act with the same um, native web APIs, just like this. And the way we can define an edge runtime in Next.js 13 is by simply exporting a cons runtime and that runtime can be, for example, edge. And just like that, our functions are now running in the edge runtime. If I made a request using Postman again, you'd see nothing really changed. Everything is still the same, but they are A, faster, with the trade-off being that you have access to less APIs in the edge runtime. So for example, if you're using a Prisma database, because Prisma uses something like Rust under the hood, that is not compatible with the less API access you have in the edge runtime. You can't do any Prisma fetching or writing to the database at all in the edge runtime. If you'd like more info on this, I'm going to link the documentation page. You can see there are a couple of network and encoding APIs, but there are overall way less web APIs that we have access to in the edge runtime. Again, I'm not going to bore you with implementation details. It's all in the documentation if you and want to know more on that. But these are the basics of how to write your functions. That's how you get data from a GET request, like this with the search params, and from a POST request. And this is how you return your responses, either as JSON or as plain strings, which is sometimes just fine. Man, if you've been following along with the video and learned about all these things, good job. They are truly setting you up to write modern full stack web development code inside of Next.js. Very, very cool. Just to quickly summarize, we've taken a look at rendering, at routing, at SEO best practices, and also at writing your own API endpoints. Those are the big four areas that are new in Next.js 13, and I gave my absolute best to explain them as good as possible to you. I really hope you enjoyed. If you liked the video, make sure to drop a like, and then I'll see you in the next one. Have a good one and bye-bye.